everyone to the Dog Entrepreneur Podcast, where we bring good business to light. And I am excited to have one of the first people I ever spent money with to learn dog training, Mark Goldberg. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Gary Cassara, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I appreciate getting your first money. And I'm sure that check is going to clear any day now. <laughs> Sure, it's going to clear. I am from New Jersey. You have to be careful. <laughs> I know that. So am I. So uh, what exit? I, I got you covered here, Gary. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you and your listening audience today. And you have been doing this for a while, huh? Long time. I, I started training my, well, just like most dog trainers, I started training my dog, and that was in 1969. They had dogs back then, huh? Well, they did. And uh, like normal people were enjoying the summer of love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was enjoying the summer of, of uh, sit down, stay, heel, and come. So, oh, Gus. Um, they did have dogs back then. Um, sadly, I was uh, too young and too narrow-minded to uh, to really, uh, you know, enjoy the times. But um, I, I did get a whole sort of, you know, life's passion and career out of it. So I, I have no complaints. And that's why I wanted to have you on today because – you are definitely one of my role models as far as marketing and business. You really have a lot of experience that way. You're one of the first trainers that I saw putting out content for their clients, um, teaching crate training and puppy manners and, you know, giving clients resources. Did that just, did that come from your publishing background or what, when did you start to actually create your own content and found that that was something valuable for your audience? Well, I had a very funny journey into this industry, and that's because I started training when I was a, a kid. So I often say I was, I was a child bride to dog training, and it really was a passion. But in that era, it was very difficult to make a living out of it, so I didn't try. I mean, mind you, I, I had my first paying clients when I was still in uh, junior high school because my, my teachers paid me to train their dogs, and I trained my way all through college for supplemental money, and and pretty much always since. Um, but I never really heavily monetized it. For me, it was always kind of a, um, a hobby that paid for, for a long time. And I did go into publishing because I enjoyed writing and editing. And uh, we can talk about that uh, more a little bit later because that led me to write a book recently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but the major thing is, is that, yeah, I did get used to um, uh, expressing myself in the written form. And so as I got deeper and deeper into the professional level of dog training, I realized how much support materials would be helpful to my clients. I got, I, I, I literally got exhausted from explaining the same concepts over and over and over again to people. And so I began to put them in writing and to share them not only among dog training clients, but also among dog trainers who were also thirsty for that kind of content to support their work with their clients. So um, that is why you would have seen so much uh, written material, and then ultimately some videos, uh, podcasts, different different forms of media just to get the word out about how one can cope with a dog. Because training is one thing, but people really like support materials to remind them about why <laughs> you know they're doing all this stuff that we tell them to do. Absolutely. And one of the things I love most about you and what I wanted to talk about is I almost enjoy, nothing personal, but I almost enjoy when you don't answer the phone because I love listening I, I put myself in the, the client first time calling Mark Goldberg. I love your voicemail messages. They always make me laugh. They always make me feel if I did have a dog good about where I'm going to be investing my time and my education. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. And a couple interesting stats I found before we got on the call was 75% of calls are not completed on the first attempt. So as far as your experience... Does that sound accurate? A lot of times when clients are calling you, you're not picking up on the first time. You're in the middle of other things. Yeah, it's extremely rare that uh, a client is getting through to me on the first ring. That's true. So what That's happened? When, when did you – because I, 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 I almost want to give your phone number out. I won't. But I, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for not – you, 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 you good people can find me on my website. But what, what I have to say, let, let's just roll it back real quick one, one step further. Let me tell you a quick story if that's sure, okay. Sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, I, for in the early years, I had a you know, pretty standard voicemail. And um, I remember a, a client calling me. 
and he said to me, Mark, you know, I, I want to give you a little bit of constructive criticism. And I said, sure, you know, go ahead. And I thought he was just going to bitch about the fact that he didn't get directly through to me that he got voicemail at all. But what he said was, your voicemail is not well done. It, it sounds exactly like some kind of a voicemail that you recorded on a phone standing in the middle of a field or wherever you were. He said, and at the level that you are, he said, for, for example, he said, your website gives the... Um, gives the, uh, the, the, the knowledge that you're uh, at the top of your game here. So you're going to be dealing with upper echelon clientele. He goes, and I'll be honest, we expect to get a human being on the phone. And I took that to heart. So although I have voicemail, Gary, um, because some clients certainly are going to you know, find, find my phone number or I'm going to give it to them. So a lot of them are going to get my voicemail. But my website largely directs people to an 800 number. Because after I had that conversation years ago with that fellow, I, I, I hired a, um, an answering service so that there would be a live human being answering my phones 24-7, even on Christmas. And so then, of course, the trick became trickier yet, which is how to hire one, uh, an answering service, how to, to, how to communicate to them what you want, make sure they're the right people, give them a little bit of a script, but not too much, and et cetera. So... Although some of my clients are calling my personal cell phone as the first contact with me, usually they have already spoken to the answering service. Then I have gotten um, a, uh, an email, really. So the process is you call into my 800 number, you're greeted on, on the second or third ring by a human being who takes some information from you, uh, including what's on your mind, but also some basic data that every dog trainer is going to want to know about the dog. Breed, age, sex, name spay neuter status, quick word or two about your trading issues. And the, the, the second they're off the phone, that has been emailed to me and this, so I can respond. So um, I, I do like voicemail, but I don't use it as a primary line of defense now. Okay. Interesting. And that, that has gotten you a, a better result as far as conversions, you think, having the person-to-person -person contact right away? Yeah, I, d I definitely think so. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, the, the reason is, is that everyone listening now can think back to calling a roofer, a plumber, somebody that they think is in the trades, and how many times you've gotten kind of a scratchy, crappy kind of a voicemail. And you instantaneously make the mental connection that you're dealing with a very small, not tremendously professional uh, business. Right. So that, that is the same judgment that people cast on us. So I think if you're going to do as almost all of us do, as I still do, which is to have a voicemail on my personal cell phone and to use that for business reasons, I think it's very important that you think about the nature of that voicemail, like what it's going to communicate to people, um, because it will be the first representation that the average client has with you and your company. And they're going to make a quick decision about whether they really want that call back or whether they're just going to you know, go right back online and continue to call other dog trainers. So do you have a formula that you go through? Because I know you. the other thing that's really good about what you do is you change it frequently. I, I, I very rarely hear the same message almost, I feel like, month after month. It's you know, some type of, hey, congratulations on making the first step to making you know, a better relationship. Now, with I, your, I, I mean, yeah, I, I remember that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I got to tell you, actually, um, that is the, the reason that I change it is not necessarily that I am attempting to um, find the perfect answering machine message or that I'm getting bored with mine. It's because I travel a good amount, and so I need a primary message and then a secondary message, and I need to be able to swap between them. Mm. And um, the, the fact of the matter is that the iPhone doesn't let you do that. <laughs> mm. Android might, but iPhone will hold sort of, it's silly now that I think about it, but they really only hold one custom message at a time. So um, when I'm traveling, I have to change it, and then I change it back, and I never wrote down the script, so I just <laughs> wing it again, you know? But um, there are some elements that I like. Um, and, and one of them is I want to sound engaging. Oh, can you? And what I know is based on what the caller is hearing, they're going to make a decision in terms of whether they um, call another 17 dog trainers just waiting to see which one calls back first. So um, I'm, I'm looking to create a little personality there. And um, so I, I do think about these things. And... Some of the key things for me are get into a quiet place. Uh, don't be afraid to re-record it and try and sound like you're happy 
<laughs> you know, like you're happy they called. You're not feeling interrupted. Uh, hey, this is Mark. How are you? Thanks for calling. I'd like to tell you a quick word about what to do and leave a message. Mm -hmm. And then I go ahead and tell them what to do. One time I forgot I was I was recording my I'm away message. So here's who I want you to call my partner. Um, and I was in the middle of an airport and I, it violates my rule about doing messages, you know, someplace like very quiet so that you don't get tons of background noise. And there was a lot of background noise, and I knew it while I was recording. So uh, I took advantage of it. Hey, this is Mark, and as you can tell from the background noise, I'm in an airport, which yep. means I'm leaving, but here's what I want you to do. Um, you, you just kind of have to take advantage of your natural surroundings. So if you're recording something that you like and there's a dog barking in the background, you can say, and you can hear Rover. He's saying, I'm next, so I've got to be quick and leave you this message. And you go ahead and respond to mine, and we'll get your dog started too. Uh, whatever it is, just kind of roll with it. But if, if you can get somewhere quiet, that's probably your best bet. Put some, keep it short. You know that I find a lot of dog trainers try and list out every service or they want the, the phone message to fill like 27 functions. Like there's information there for a client they've never spoken to before. There's information there for the clients who are attending their next class. And there's information on how to get an application for the following class. And then there's a weather report in case we're canceling class next week. Um, <laughs> you know, by, by the, if your message exceeds 30 seconds, most people are going to hang up on it. So um, I would keep it short, punchy, and give people a call to action. Tell them exactly what you want them to do. So there were my other two things that I was going to ask you. Do you give a callback expectation 24 hours, 48 hours? How, how do you handle that? You know, I don't. Um, my current message just says something to the effect of um, I, I will get back to you shortly. But because um, I don't like to be tied in to a specific. I'll tell you what, if you if you're going to leave a time expectation, then keep it. <laughs> you know, make sure that you're really good about uh, meeting that obligation. Otherwise, you really started the whole relationship off wrong. I, I'll tell you what I like a whole lot better than I will call you back within 24 hours. I learned something from a buddy of mine who's a real estate agent, and he was getting really busy, which is a nice thing for a real estate agent. He was getting really busy, and um, I noticed um, when I called him, and if I, you know, my friend, if I didn't get him, his message was real personable. You know, hey, this is Steve, and sorry that you didn't reach me. And basically, what he did was, he, in his message, he encouraged people to send a text for quicker response rather than. Um, uh, he, he encouraged sending a text for quicker response rather than um, leaving an actual voicemail message. And I found that this made a great deal of difference. Anyway, um, what he did was in his call, he said something to the effect of, hey, this is Steve. Thanks for calling. I'm interested in helping you with your real estate needs. So leave a message or for quicker response, send a text to this phone number. And um, I asked him about that. I said, hey, I noticed that you changed your your voicemail and you're asking for the text. He said, yeah, it was so difficult going through um, strings of like 10, 12 voicemail messages, which by the way, if you think about it, it doesn't, it sounds like, you know, like, uh, like such a small problem, like what a nice problem to have. But in reality, it, it actually is problematic because when you're even the visual voicemail on an iPhone or a, um, or an Android phone, which is probably what most of us are using these days, one, one or the other of those, when you're looking at that string of messages, it becomes really difficult to prioritize them. Oh, yeah. Because you, you don't know the full content of them, right? So now you're looking at basically this mess and you're poking at them, trying to figure out, like, take notes and which one can you listen to first. Um, or you're looking at the transcriptions, which depending on, you know, what transcription is being done. iOS kind of is bad. Um, um, uh, Google voice is pretty good. Um, but nonetheless, you're, you're poking through these, trying to prioritize them and it can be really difficult. So I immediately decided to copy him on that. And I was really pleased to find that a very large majority of my clients will hear that voicemail message and they will respond with a text. Most of them don't even leave a message anymore. Um, they just hit me with a quick text. Now, the ones who leave a voicemail instead of the text, usually it's because they want to leave a whole lot more detail. Or maybe they are um, less technically savvy, which really usually translates to older. And it's good to know that because 
I can, I do call them back, of course, but I want to talk to them at a moment when I have time. So I schedule those calls back for maybe after the dogs have been fed in the evening when I have a little bit of downtime. The, so I have to say, Gary, more and more I'm dealing with people on those messages, at least initially by text, and there's huge advantage in that. It's more visual. Um, it, the, the history of it gets saved, so you can always scroll back and look. The open issue items are really kind of easier to access. And the crazy thing is I have sold a fair amount of dog training by text and sort of used the phone to get the final details. Um, and, and I think more and more younger people, people who are, let's say, 40 and under, are extremely comfortable with that. It, and there's, there's, it's really kind of an age demographic. Um, older people are not so comfortable with that. I'm, I'm 59, so I probably wouldn't be, except for the fact that I've had to learn all this technology in order to you know, utilize it in my business. But in, in fact, actually, the younger the demographic skews, the more you have to convince them, like, listen, I don't really want to take the deposit by Facebook cash transfer. I really would like to talk to you, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I want to hear your voice. I want to know a little bit more about the dog than conveniently we could do on text. So I have actually had to ask some people, like, look, just get on the phone. Let's schedule the call. Uh, and, and that's that was a shock to me. So the biggest piece of advice I guess I can give people is, Think about your message before you record it. Get somewhere quiet. If you're not somewhere quiet, turn it into a joke and explain it, but make it sound like it's in, in, you know, in, in the favor of your business and your, your qualifications. And uh, offer people the option for quicker response to leave a text, and that's how I say it, so that they, they realize there's something in it for me if I actually go ahead and send a text instead. One of the facts that I found was 60% of the incoming calls are less important than the work you're doing right now. So even if you're calling back somebody and they really need dog training, there's a 60% chance what they're doing is more important. So if you text, they can answer back on their time. And that's an easier way to communicate. My business mentor always has this joke where he says, you know, when he's giving a talk, he'll say, uh, everybody raise their hand if the last person that called you actually made you annoyed. And it's because it's, you're stealing our time. I want to watch my show when I want to watch my show. I want to answer you back when it's convenient for me. And text gives that ability to be able to answer back when it's convenient for me. Um, so that's a very interesting thing that you're finding kind of organically. Real quick, doesn't that work both ways? You know, be, since I have gone to the message which asks uh, or at least gives the option of a text, I mean, I, it's gently suggested as a better alternative, but that's kind of subliminal because I don't want to make them feel like they're not allowed to leave a message, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, but, but it works both ways. I, now, I'm in the middle of dinner. I am a whole lot less likely to grab that phone when it goes off. I'm a lot likelier to hit the red button and mm -hmm. send it to voicemail because I'll probably get a text, which I can answer, you know, between mouthfuls if I'm so inclined without getting sucked into a conversation in the middle of my dinner, right? So we dog trainers tend to burn out on these bloody phones because – we view every incoming call as something that we have to snag or we're going to lose a customer. And uh, so the right approach to voicemail actually can kind of change your your view of the telephone. And weirdly, meaning your, your satisfaction level when you grab it, I am a whole lot less likely to answer phone calls in the bathroom at meal times when I'm with friends. Uh, I am a lot less likely to do that now or even training a dog. And oddly, by the way, I'm able to answer texts lots of times when I'm training a dog. I have a dog on a sit stay. I do a quick answer to the text, which says something like, you know, thanks for calling. I'm, I'm going to definitely get back to you uh, late, a little later this afternoon. And then I do that. But they've gotten right away confirmation that their voice has been heard. And I think that's really important. So when I get a text, I try to respond to it very rapidly. Um, I, I, it's not always that I can, but mostly I can. Even if I'm putting them off, I'm giving them a rough idea of thanking them for calling and letting them know more or less when I'm going to get back to them. And that stops them from having an open issue. You, you know, the issue is at least 
temporarily resolved for them. And psychologically, that's really important because we've made the connection. They've reached out to me. I've responded. And we have made basically a, uh, a connection and an agreement to carry that forward. Mm-hmm. So that, that's super important. And this is why I had you on because you're so smart. Well, the last piece of um, – the last – stat that I had here, which is you already just hit it with 70%, 76% of business is not time sensitive. So you were just saying about how a lot of young trainers burn out by thinking every phone call that comes in is like dire importance. There's an interesting stat that 76% of it is not of dire urgency. Yeah, you guys are going to live a lot longer if you're not diving, dive bombing on the phone like it was a hand grenade, <laughs> you know, every time it goes off, you'll feel a lot better. And by the way, you know, one final thought. And that is, usually, I think people think you're a little more exclusive if they can't get through to you instantaneously. Like, why are you not busy? I'm calling you in the middle of the day. Why are you not mm-hmm. busy? Is I think subliminally what they think. So when they get your message, they understand that you're a busy person, which is psychologically good for them. But that text connection lets them know that you're also attentive to details and you've made a personal connection with them already. So... Um, People who do not text are going to leave you a message. People who text are really comfortable with that method of communication. And when you give them a quick touch back and let them know you'll be getting back to them in a more meaningful way soon, you, you've, you've opened the conversation. And that's, that's really critical because it, will, um, it, it means that usually those people, they often, in fact, go back to your website and start studying the details a little harder to prepare for the call. So it's a good way. Now talk about attention to detail. Somebody wrote a book. I, I did. I did. I, um, I wrote a book with uh, a dear friend of mine and my, and now my co-author, um, and that is brother Christopher. And he writes under, um, well, this book is actually, um, written by Mark Goldberg and the monks of New Skeet, or more accurately, the monks of New Skeet and Mark Goldberg. So if you don't know who the monks of New Skeet are, S-K-E-T-E, then you should Google them. But this is a fascinating group of guys who have written New York Times best-selling dog books in the past, including How to Be Your Dog's Best Friend and The Art of Raising a Puppy. Well, Brother Christopher and I have written a book called Let Dogs Be Dogs, and it contains pretty much everything that both of us know about how to live with a dog in a way that makes him just a good dog, makes the relationship good, and means that the training that you do sticks. Because, you know, if you think about it, Gary, and and most dog trainers, unless they're competition trainers, like you're going to go to IPO or you're going to go into AKC uh, obedience or rally or agility. If you're a dog trainer who just, you know, enjoys your dogs, you you, you probably can't even recall when you trained them. (laughs) You know, they just kind of sucked knowledge up from living with you. And I know that it's that way for for my dogs. I, I don't remember doing a whole lot of formal training with any of my dogs because I had a lifetime to just teach them and they just wrapped their brain around mine. And well, they did that because I knew how to not humanize them, how to make them happy and how to make them want to please me. And um, so brother Christopher and I put into this book, literally everything we could think of, everything that we know about how to, how to improve the human dog bond. And the nice thing about that is I don't care what kind of dog trainer you are this book is compatible. So it, because we're not so much talking about training, we're talking about lifestyle. And one thing every dog trainer knows is you see a dog now and again, you tell the client what to do. You're lucky if they do it. And you're also lucky if they don't take your dog home and untrain it. <laughs> yes. Know? So, so this, uh, this really speaks to how to keep the training that you've paid for. And you can pre-order it on Amazon right now. You can, it's going to ship any minute now. Oh, it's, wow. uh, yeah, we're about one month out. It'll start shipping on September 12th, but you can pre-order it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or pretty much any of those online services where books are sold. I know there's an audio book. A lot of people have asked me about audible.com. I don't know. Um, but there is a, a also there's a Kindle version and a Nook version. So most any format that you might want, uh, you can buy Let Dogs Be Dogs today. That is so exciting. Do you have a copy of it yourself? Well, you know, I do. I have a preview copy and soft cover, but the uh, brother Christopher called me yesterday and said he received the hard cover in the mail and I just didn't get mine yet. <laughs> oh. so, 
because it's being mailed from New York and I'm in Chicago. Yep. I'm a little further, so I'm, oh, man. I'm, 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 I'm on, I'm, I'm on tenterhooks waiting for, uh, you know, for my, my hardback copy, but it's off the press guys and you can get your, your, uh, your order in now. Lifetime of knowledge. A lot, two people with a lot of experience in that book. Wow. Every page is going to be filled with insights. I can't wait to see it. I have to say, I think even, um, I think, you know, listen, new, newer dog trainers, I think there's a ton of information in there that will be very beneficial even to the trainer. Um, I think the old grizzled salty dogs are likely still to even pick up a trick or two out mm-hmm. of the book. But I think the biggest thing that, lo- that let dogs be dogs will do for dog trainers, the biggest thing is if you recommend it to your clients, they will uh, have a better result from your services. And that, that's because they will know how to create an environment at home where your training can take root and, and, and prosper and really dig in and do what it is that they, they want it to do for them. Because basically, everybody calls a dog trainer saying, make it stop. <laughs> you know, like that. <laughs> and um, you'll have a much easier time of that if they know the ways they are subtly contributing to making it start in the first place, right? Absolutely. And, a happier client is going to give you better online reviews and it's going to send you more referrals. So I, I think of this book as a companion reading that if I were, um, honestly, I'm going to ask all my clients to read it because I think it will make my board and train program way more effective for them. And I think I'm going to have happier clients. So um, I, I think other dog trainers may well find the same thing. So that that's why I want you guys to read it to see if you agree with me on that point. That's wonderful. You know, you know me. I'll be picking up my uh, waiting at the box on September. What is it? You said the twelfth at ships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. That's that's reasonably soon now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of your information. When the book comes out, maybe we can talk more about it. That would be wonderful. We can and we will. And thanks to the audience for listening to us. And uh, hey, appreciate your time. So, Mark, where can they find out more about all of this, the book, and you? Oh, well, my, my personal website is chicagodogtrainer.com. And now that I think of it, we also set up a website for the book, and that is letdogsbedogs.org. So there's more information in both places. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend, Mark. Thanks, Gary. Bye.